So my name is Johan Eker. I work at uh, Ericsson Research in Lund uh, at the, what used to be the mobile, the mobile cell phone uh, division when I started 13 years ago. So I started with making uh, software for small devices. Uh, and among other things, we did the first Linux phone at the point in time where people said that nobody would ever run Linux and Java on a cell phone. That was completely out of the question. And then 10 years later, we all know where, what happened. Uh, and after that, we moved on to multi-core programming for base stations. So I'm a software guy. And then two and a half years ago, I was moved to, the whole division was moved to cloud. So since uh, uh, two and a half years ago, I'm actually running, what you see in the background here, it's a data center. It used to be the build cluster for the cell phone division. And when they closed that down two and a half years ago, we just took it over. So now I'm a cloud uh, or data center uh, driver. And I, in my inbox now, I have like 25 emails because it was a crash in, during the weekend. So it's, it's, a, it's, very, it's very exciting. It's, it's, a, it's a learning experience. Um, and besides being at Ericsson Research, I also work at the, the control department at Lund University, so where I'm a joint professor. So I'll, and my, back, my background is in automatic control, so it's, a, it's mostly software. So I'm, I'm not really a guy who do sort of value creation for customers. I don't know very, I know very little about that. But I, I think this talk will sort of uh, have a you know, slight touch on that. I, the, the, the outline of the talk is I will talk about Exxon Research, um, you know, who we are, a few minutes. Then I will talk about a couple of trends. And for those of you who have, who have not been in a coma for the last five years, it's kind of obvious, but you know, bear with me. It's, you know, it's, it's a bunch of trends that I think are sort of converging to, towards a very interesting point. And then I will talk about some uh, use cases where Ericsson is involved, and then finally, the solution that we are working on at Ericsson Research in Lund. And please feel free to interrupt me at any point. I think this is much more fun if, we, if you challenge me and say that you, you don't agree or that it uh, might be you have a better solution. I think that is really super. Okay, so yes, disclaimer, you know, this is not Ericsson Re Ericsson's policy or the, the, if you think that something is interesting, I don't know, I don't expect you to want to buy something, but if you find something interesting, it might be the case that it will take five years or 10 years before it's done, or, it'll, or it might never be done, or it might be, you know, we're going in a completely different direction. So it's not the official uh, pol uh, policy of Ericsson. So who Ericsson? We are roughly 650 people. We divided um, on three continents. Um, basically, 50% of everybody who works at Ericsson Research is, has a PhD. And if you go in Lund, I would say that that maybe is 60, 70%, and quite a few uh, joint professors and, uh, and so on. So it's a, it's a fairly academic environment. You can think of it as, as a university without the burden to apply for proposals and make uh, reports. We just have to do research instead. So it's a, it's a very nice place to be. Uh, and we are divided into a, a bunch of, you can think of it as departments, you know, have the cloud research, we have the radio access technology research, we have the security research and so on. So it's, we're basically divided into eight departments all over the world. I know the radio is, is uh, I think we have, we have two radio departments. One is wireless access network, which is sort of the layer three. Uh, and then we have the sort of the ra radio layer. Uh, th and those together are roughly 300 people or 250. And then we have the cloud. We are uh, right now 50 people. It's hard to maintain people in cloud. In particular, we go to Montreal and, and San Jose. Those people are leaving all the time. So uh, it's hard to retain them. And they are very expensive to keep. <laughs> And they are so, so companies like Google and Microsoft and others are just stealing them away. So it's so we're shrinking all the time at the cloud. So uh, working in in, um, in telecom business has a certain level of you know, predictability. When I show these people to some in some groups, they tend to think of it as an intelligence test. So what is the what is this, the next symbol here to the right? Well, you know, they, we started for in in this in this beginning of the 80s with NMT, you know, analog telephone. We have GSM coming in in the, in the late 80s. Um, you know, foundation of mobile broadband 3G came in 2003, something like that. And here we got IP connectivity. Uh, very low bandwidth, like 384 kilobits per second. And then we have 4G not so long ago, which actually go, gives us bit rates up to 40 megabit per second, which is fairly decent. You can surf and watch Netflix and so on. 
And then we have what we are working on right now, what we sort of at Ericsson call the network society, where everything that benefits from being connected will be connected. And everything that does not benefit from being connected will likely also be connected. So, <laughs> but it's not, it's not as catchy. So the thing is, what, what is 5G then? You know, 5G is, is a set of, right now, is a set of expectations, I would say. We are, the 5G standardization process is, is just started. Um, in, in some countries, I mean, South Korea is, is promising to have uh, a 5G network for the Olympic Games in two years. Um, we will be ahead of the standard. I think basically the standard will have started at that point in time. I'm not a radio guy, but that's what I hear. So it's, it's a, and if you find those, those slides, uh, those pictures is from, from uh, the Ericsson Mobility Report, which is available on the web with, with facts and, and stuff. So it's, it's a good, which is a good source for information in, in this business. We want to know more about 5G and what's happening. It's, it's the Ericsson Mobility Report. So basically what we, what, what we have now with 5G is a set of uh, requirements um, that we know can be fulfilled, but you cannot have them all at the same time. So basically we have uh, data rates that is uh, in the range of gigabit, ten, tens of gigabit. And, and the Ericsson... We have a demo lab in, in Shista where you have five, six gigabits being demonstrated. And that has also been demonstrated in Barcelona. So those, this is, you know, that's, that's going. Well, network latency, which, which is sub-millisecond, which means that the connectivity from the, from the, from the uh, terminal or the sensor to the, the base station will be less than one millisecond. So it's not the full app, app response time? Well... I would say that, um, I, mean, I mean, there is speed of light and those things that comes into play. <laughs> but I, I, would, I would guess that, you know, I, I would guess, I, will in, I tend to interpret that as from terminal to base station. Some people say it's, it's a round trip, but, you know, since it's just requirements, we can make it up as we go along. But I think it's, it's safe to say that one millisecond will be difficult to achieve even for terminal to, to base station only. It's a... So I, I, you know, so I mean, but I, I, network latency is around one millisecond. And if you if you really want to have a one millisecond for controlling your car, you might want to do something else. I would say, it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's. So and then capacity expansion by a factor of, of thousand, and efficiency gains by a factor of, of a thousand per transported bit. And those two things are geared towards Internet of Things, saying that we, I mean, this is basically saying that we would like to connect everything. And if we want to connect everything, there has to be battery-powered devices that can last for a long period of time. Um, and we have to be able to connect not only thousands of devices, but maybe tens of thousands of devices to each base station. So that those are the requirements are sort of gearing into Internet of Things. Um, and when this standard is done, it's a... Um, maybe 2019, 20 or something, I do be done. Um, but the technology for, for doing this is in place. So for example, to, to get those high data rates, you have multi, multi uh, MIMO antennas, you have many antennas, both on the, on the base station and on the cell phone, uh, and you have beam forming, so you can basically direct your antenna towards a certain device, creating a, a much more efficient communication channel. So those, this is basically 5G in a nutshell. And if you're interested in 5G, there are lots of white papers on, on the homepage. Another thing that comes along with, with uh, 5G is virtualization of the network infrastructure. So all, what ha what's happened over the years is that operators have virtualized their IT infrastructure, like, like everybody else. So basically moving the service into the cloud and thereby saving lots of, of money. By, you know, simplified management and all the things that we can we know it's good with cloud. So, what they came up with was the idea to why don't we why can't we just virtualize the infrastructure itself? You know, so the day today we are Ericsson is selling and, and all others like us are selling boxes boxes that are a firewall, a deep packet inspector, is switches and those things, and those are basically you know, standard uh, processor x86. Um, and others that are comes in boxes, and we put some software. We do a tight integration, and we sell it to them for a fairly high price. So they, if they look into the box, they see an x86, and they go, oh, "Why do we need to pay so much for that one? We can just have a regular server, which is much cheaper, because we don't charge for the software." 
Well, I think that wouldn't change. But what's happening now is it was called Network Functions Virtualization, which is an Etsy standard for taking those classical appliances and moving them onto standard high volume servers. Um, and then the network functionality comes as a virtual machine. So you buy a standard Dell or Ericsson server, and then you put a virtual machine on top, which is standardized. And this standard is called NFV, and there is an open source framework called Open OPNFV that Ericsson is, is part of. So, I, so what was happening here is basically the, that you know, the everything in between part in my talk is that used to be locked, closed boxes are now becoming open boxes that we are basically running, possibility to run those things on, on standard servers, which I think is a very exciting opportunity for or challenge for programming. And this also allowed then that if you have a firewall that is uh, overloaded, then you can just add more virtual instances of that one. So you, can, you get the dynamic scaling of everything, um, which is uh, um, you know, a huge advantage. The downside to this is, of course, that the integration of, of the software and hardware in this case was very tight, meaning that we could do with very little resources. But here, the, re the integration is, is more, uh, is, is less tight and therefore more resource consuming. So if you then look on, on um, this is a, again a picture from the Ericsson Mobility Report. Just sort of, you know, this, this talk is about exponential curves. Things are going exponentially it's like this. You'll see a trend. So what is happening here is basically the number of cell phones are moving from where we are right now to here, it's not so much, going from 7.1 billion subscriptions to 8.7. So it's, you know, it, it's just, given that we are only 7.5 people in the world, 8.7 subscriptions is, 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 is a lot for cell phones. Uh, if you then add the PC laptops, um, which is 2.8 billion, together it's, uh, people are getting more and more connected, which I think is a good thing for us. Uh, but what is more interesting is that the, the machine to machine which is uh, sort of the old world word for, for IoT, um, is increasing quite a lot from 2.6 billion to 10.7. And this is, this is the non-cellular ones, which is basically uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, etc. And then you have the machine to machine and consumer electronics, which is cellular, that is uh, going up with a factor of, of three in total. So what, what the official number from, from Ericsson Mobility Report, those guys are relating this report once uh, a quarter, is 28 billion 2021. We, for a long time, we had the slogan 50 billion devices, but we have to, that was sort of a change to 28. So there. What was, happened to the other 20 billion? Well, I think they, they just, I mean, that 50 billion devices was something that came up in the, the spur of the moment before the keynote. I have to have the number for that 50 billion devices. I think that was how it happened. It was long time, it was many years ago that came out. Yeah. And uh, I, th I, don't think, I, I think this is based on research or some serious predictions. I think the first was just some uh, hand waving. But uh, so I, I, I mean, this is, this is based on, on the numbers and trends and, and the data from, the, from uh, operators. So, and another thing that is also obvious to ev each and every one is that you know, we, we see those you know, fitness trackers and all those devices. And if you just, if you open up one of those here and just, you know, see what was really in there. So you have a Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, FM receiver for two and a half bucks. And you have some gyroscope accelerometer for 1.20, blah, blah, blah. So basically, each of those sensors will cost you one dollar. You know, so, so the, the, the outlook that we should have lots of sensors might actually be true. I mean, we, it's, it's, it's plausible to believe that given the, the, the cost for each of those to, to build your own sensor or have lots of them, it's uh, actually it comes up to $7.35 for a fairly capable you know, fitness tracker if you just look on, on sort of the, the details. And the rest is programming. So sort of, and this, this also speaks in favor of, of uh, IoT happening. I know I'm, you know I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know, it's a, so if you want to read emails, that's fine with me. But this is, this is sort of, but I, I actually believe that you have to put the pieces together. That it's not only that we believe that things will happen, but you also have the data. And I think this sort of indicates that 
that um, you know, it might happen. And then another thing that cloud came out, I mean, cloud is, is basically just uh, a business model. It has nothing to do with technology. It's, it's just, you know, you, you take together virtualization and uh, commodity servers and et cetera, and you, and you add that, and you sell that you know, per, per minute and per hour, and you have add scalability, you have standard interfaces and so on. So, so basically cloud came out as just a cost saver. The way of convenient management, but what was moving from, from started out as a cost saver is now, and with, with, with this we were selling infrastructure service, basically virtual machines. We're now moving to a point where we are providing intelligence as a service. You can think of IBM has uh, divided their company into three or four bit pieces where one of them is, is focusing on, on Watson, providing Watson as a service. Uh, and you can go for, uh, have, IBM also have their, their uh, blue mix, which have lots of, of analytics capabilities. And if you, t if you think of the analytics capabilities when they are packaged in, in, in as a service, then you can give it to <laughs> psychologists, to uh, pharmacologists, and provide, give them a toolbox with, with um, uh, deep learning algorithms that are geared towards their particular area and, and actually sell that as a service. So cloud goes from being a just infrastructure but being a much more intelligent uh, version of that. And this is from Kurzweil, you know, his, his uh, you know, the guy. He, he, he did really good keyboard once upon a time, but now he's this guy at MIT who does predictions. Um, and he, I think this is, this is from his book, The Singularity, where he predicts that one human brain will be around 20, 30 or so. Well, who knows? It's easy to make predictions when you know you're going to be dead at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, and this, this here was, uh, came out last week that uh, IBM makes quantum computing available on IBM Cloud to accelerate innovation. It's, uh, it's only, you can get five qubits uh, on this one, so it, you can't do that much. You can get some gates and stuff, you know, logic. But, it, you know, it's an interesting thing that if you, you know, should everybody have their own quantum computer? Maybe not, but we will see, um, you know, maybe it's interface through a cloud um, uh, API. And then, of course, we have this guy from also last week where AI machine beats college kids at football. We know that, that AI can beat you know, the, the champion in Jeopardy in chess and recently also in Go, but we didn't know about football yet. So it's, you know, we are making huge advances. So what's happening, in, in, another thing in cloud that is happening is that we are, and Ericsson is part of this, we are disaggregating the, the, the data center. So what used to be servers that came in, you know, the commodity servers that came in, in racks with uh, you know, CPU, storage, memory, network cards, are now being completely disaggregated. So you get a rack here, and then you have slaves with CPU, RAM, network interfaces, disks, and other things that you sort of configure it dynamically. And you combine this with a, a software system that actually configures it online. So not only, so it is, but today we have a CPU and you put your virtual machine on that CPU and that the memory is available to that CPU is, is you can, can be used by that virtual machine and so on. In this setup here, you can actually configure how much memory each CPU can access, uh, how the bus is configured and so on. It's a, basically a software, conf, software defined infrastructure and then you have the software-defined networking. So the networking today is, is completely virtual. So here you combine a setting where you have everything in the, in the data center is being software-defined. So it's, it's programmable, programmable to, the, to the lowest level. And this is actually, it's a product that we are going to release um, fairly soon. I, I will be getting one of those to my data center uh, in a week or so. So it's a... It's a Okay, so you, uh, you get the picture here. I mean, we get more of everything. We get more of the things we like. We get less of the things we don't like. So, and it's getting it cheaper. So the question is, what are we going to use this for? So, so basically what, what I'm saying here is that we can imagine that everything from the, the data center here, which is an Amazon data center maybe, and then to have internal data center in the core network from Ericsson, and then you have the core net infrastructure with switches, routers, um, 
IMS nodes, etc., to the base stations and down to devices. All of those are getting, becoming prog programmable. We can actually add code that is our code on all those pieces here. Which, so that's, that's sort of the infrastructure that we are looking at. What if this is the, 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 our computer? And then we say that the, the, the difference here is that running code in, in this part of the, of the spectrum will be fairly inexpensive. You have lots of power. You can scale up and down um, quickly. But there will be a certain latency going here. If you, on the other hand, will place your you know, code in, in this part here for short latency, then you will get um, short latency, but it will be associated with a higher cost. So there's some, some uh, trade-offs involved in this. So the applications we are, are um, involved in range from, from mining to health, transport, augmented reality, and surveillance. And I will just go through a few of those. Um, with transport, we are engaged with KTH in this integrated transport lab in, in Shista. Uh, and we also have, since last week, we actually have a bus that drives around without a driver uh, connected to the cloud in Shista. Uh, I haven't tried it myself, but it's uh, since uh, one or two weeks back. We are working with Boo Liden uh, with mining. Um, we have some health projects, but I don't think they are disclosed. We have augmented reality. We're actually working with, with the, I'm working with the psychology professor. This is, this is not really sort of the main line, Eric something, but psychology professor where we have an EEG helmet. You know those guys? We have a, get 50 channels with uh, one kilohertz and you sample that and you send it to the cloud for some uh, machine learning to see what you can get of those. It's, a, it's very noisy, I can say, but you know, it's a... <laughs> Are you finding so far on that one? Well, you, you, you can do some, some serious... Uh, uh, you can actually do some mind reading that actually works. You, and you can play pinball. And uh, the reaction time for, for this helmet, too, is, is faster than your, your hands. Because the ones it's, cause the, So you think something before, it actually goes to your hand. And you think something before... You, you, do, you react before you think. That's sort of you... You have the, there's this something is ignited, and then you will move your hands, and then you will, you know, your, your cognitive part of the brain will, will be light up. And so everything we think is sort of uh, afterthoughts and, and reconstructions of. <laughs> so, why did I push that button? I don't know, but you know, I have a plausible story that I will make up at later. But that's, you know, it's a. Uh, so. Oh, can you say since we have access here. Can you say a few words about surveillance? Yeah, I will go to... So I will... I will oh. <laughs> no, I think, it's, I think, I think surveillance is, is a super uh, interesting um, case. We are, we are working a little bit, you know, surveillance in, in general. We're working with Saab in this is WASP project, where they have a project called SAFE, which is, is basically uh, where they to assist uh, police and, and ambulance and authorities in managing disasters and then just you know, managing crime, surveillance of cities. Somebody's, there's a burglar somewhere, they hook up to a surveillance camera and then they coordinate you know, that kind of... So it's, it's mostly a coordination system where they have uh, you know, 3D mapping, uh, maps... Uh, uh, well, you, you can figure it out. It's, 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 it's a fairly... Um, it's, it's an only cloud product at this point in time, so we're looking into making this as a service instead, just for the benefits of, of uh, what we said previously, that you can scale up and down the capacity, and you can also do coordination between different communes and different parts of the, of the, of the country to, to make sure that, I mean, it, sometimes a disaster will span over one, more than one city. You know, how will you coordinate e efforts from, from you know, between cities and so on? So I think this is a super interesting case, where we don't have a solution right now, but it, it's a, uh, you know, here is really, we can combine sensors and, and cloud and, and uh, figuring out how to, to uh, make this into cloud product. And when we think about, you know, if we think about surveillance here, I think it, uh, at, at some point, I don't think we will have surveillance in, in the access app. I think there will be cameras all over the place. I think surveillance might be an application that runs on top of, of, of the cameras. I don't know if you agree with me. Yeah. And the video is pretty boring. Uh, it's a lot of video, and you must, uh, you must make uh, 
take out the important part from the video and uh, annotate it in some way. So you can extract the value in the video yeah. rather than just storing images on the server. I agree. So that, that's the challenge, I think. The first access question I heard say that video is boring. No, it, it's <laughs> nice and slow, but, but uh, in the reality, it's not, not yeah. even a percent that it's yeah <laughs> and also I think that you, you can think of if you if you have this this structure here if you have lots of video I mean think of with 5g we are promising 10 gigabit connections here <laughs> just so and then we're promising that you're gonna have loads of devices so what was what will happen here then the, you get so previously when you designed net radio networks you could actually say that the radio, the wireless was disconnected from, you could design the wireless part disconnected from the rest because this was, the capacity here was so much higher than that one. So that they have, I mean, you don't have to take a holistic approach, but now you have taken a holistic approach because if you scale this guy up here, it's gonna choke here. So if you could move sort of filtering video out here and coordinate that, I would think that would be a very interesting application. The question is how you do it. So, um, and then we did this in, in remote operation. This is what we did in, in uh, Barcelona two years ago. Basically, put an Oculus Rift on a guy, and he's running an excavator from, from Barcelona. And, and this excavator is running somewhere in Sweden. And it's, this was done just doing wi using Wi-Fi, just to exploring the possibilities of remote operation and, and seeing that it actually worked out kind of OK. I think the dynamics in the excavator, whatever it's called, you know, scupa. <laughs> What we in Sweden, <laughs> what we in Sweden is called scoop, uh, was, was like 300 milliseconds, and, and, the, and the delay was less than that. So it, it maybe it added up to 500 milliseconds total. So it turned out okay. Um, but they didn't have any, any feedback from this. So he, he was hitting a rock. He couldn't feel that in, in, in his chair. So. so what I did last year was to um, explore with haptic handles and haptic feedbacks. How can you... Assume that you have a robot with a force sensor. This guy here is a force sensor. So if you push it, it will actually give you a signal back. So if you hit something, uh, you, can, you can notice that. So it, the problem is here, if you can, how would you control that guy? Uh, and, and here's haptic feedback, which is actually a handle where small engines in or motors. So you will actually feel, it's possible to feel pressure back. So, so now you would like to connect this over, over through the cloud, over base stations. Um, and it turns out that this is super latency sensitive. Maybe for, for us to get it to work without you know, thinking too much about it, just taking standard algorithms and so on, it went down to milliseconds for this to be actually a useful application. So maybe you don't want to do remote surgery. On the other hand, if the choice is no surgery, it's, you know, it's, you know there are lots of things we say here, like oh, nobody will ever have a camera in their room or in the bedroom or do remote surgery, but you know, Given two choices, this might actually be the preferred choice. Uh, it's, it's, we, we're not done with this yet. <laughs> we, we did the experiments, and, and we have the we're continuing this work um, uh, right now. With, but it's um, it's an interesting case. It's one of the few that actually would require this really super low latency, also, um, as we know right now. Another thing that we're working is a project called uh, 5GM, which is uh, with Ericsson. Esquep and Chalmers, are you involved in that? Not me personally. But you know about it? Yes. Yeah. So basically, and it's, uh, my boss is, is running this, so I'm not really involved. But this is basically about making a very flexible uh, factory, uh, which could be controlled with 5G nodes um, and the cloud, and how you can reconfigure the nodes um, and, the, and the cells very, very uh, dynamically uh, during runtime. And our task in this is to figure out how to program this beast. Because it is one thing that you think is getting connected and everything, but the next step is how to actually make it programmable. And then we have the, it's an interesting case, that we have the 5G mine. We were doing Boolidon. It's actually running right now. It's, it's not 5G, but they call it the 5G mine. It's actually 4G mine because we don't have 5G yet. But it, it, it's, in short, they are, are putting up 300 kilometers of, of network um, coverage inside the mines. So basically, all over the mine, you can use your standard cell phone, uh, your standard equipment to, to uh, communicate. Uh, and then in addition, they will have, Volvo will have uh, self-driving cars or autopilot cars that runs in the mine. 
And uh, we also will have uh, remote control of, of uh, excavators and, and wheel loaders and stuff. Uh, and it's uh, and they just um, um, and this is this actual slide from one of the WASP guys, Peter Birman. He was presenting this as, as a, so this is um, WASP. So and they actually launched it on, on March 31st. So it's, this guy is up and running. So it's uh, it's not fantasy. Um, and the thing is, what you know, what it's, it's here is it's not no low latency or huge uh, coverage or something. This is you know the five five G four G works fine for, for remote control. Uh, one huge benefit of using cellular net network here is to be able to use standard equipment for communication. Previously, you went into the mine, you had some special equipment with men, meant that they had an ambulance, there was some, some uh, um, uh, you know, something going on in the mine. All the rescue personnel had to switch their gear to some uh, you know, arcane um, Wi-Fi cell phones or something. Not cell phones, Wi-Fi phones. Or, so basically, being able to use standard equipment is, is a big win for this. So, we you know, the future is all about IoT. I think that I've, I've sold that now to you know, this, this already sold crowd. So, I, I think there is a few things we need to address first. You know, it, it's, you know we, we have the technology, we have uh, the, the radio is there, the price for the devices go down, the cloud is there, you know, everything is programmable and so on. Yeah, but it's, but why will this work this time? It's not the first time somebody is, is actually saying that we're going to have IoT. You remember the screen fridge? We get a browser, you have a family calendar on you, there was a screen on your fridge. Basically, the future in 2001 was a home with lots of screens, right? <laughs> that sound. And then, then um, and you can see here that the milk was, was, you had no milk, and then you can open it, you can actually. So I think that maybe the use case was not there. And then you have, you know, and another thing of those things is, is the, the Ericsson iPad, the web screen H610, which is like an iPad without the performance and the iPad experience and the apps. But, you know, but the idea is, so it's not enough to have the ideas. You have to you know, be able to fill it with something. I think that apps, is, applications is, is one of those things. That, and maybe it's not a company like Ericsson that actually will do the, you know, fill those devices with applications. Somebody else, I believe, would do that. So, uh, as I said previously, uh, I think the, mind, the apps mindset is the lack of apps was uh, um, a huge drawback. I remember when I worked at Ericsson, when we did cell phones, we were, we were um, you know, for each release, they made a new app. You know, you, you sold a new phone and it was, um, came along with the application, right? So here is a drum application. And, and you, you set, sit, sit down five males in, in the 35 years old, and, and they came out with you know, the new application is poker. <laughs> that, that's typically what, what happens. And if you open, open up the platform for others to innovate on, you get stuff like uh, Angry Birds and you know, <laughs> goat, goat Simulator. You know, th those things are not made by people who work at big companies. and, and uh, uh, you know, do things in group. Those are sort of the brainchilds of, of people who are on another dimension. So I think it's important to open up your platform for others. So I, and I think that is in particular so for IoT. I don't think that the applications I listed here will be the one that actually makes it happen. I think it will be something else. And I don't know, and I don't think I will know. So what, what we see here is from Boolean and is that what they complain about today is that basically all uh, the IoT Frameworks they are looking at as is basically you know one is one provider um, and one software you know one hardware provider and software provider and the, the interoperability is very low so basically there it's lots of silos things work fine but it's it's a uh, we're far from where we want, we want to be so this is from World Economic Forum two years ago and lack of interoperability and standards and security concerns are what concerns people most. Makes sense, right? So, but the third one is pretty big too, the uh, insufficient use, business cases or use cases. Yes. But, yeah, I, I, <laughs> but I mean, somehow I think that that is, that is uh, I don't worry about that. I think if you, if you get the others in place, I think this will come out. But I don't, I don't, I don't but in my... You're going to talk on that the last week. 
Okay, but in, in my mind, that is for, some, for somebody else. I, I, I worry about those two. Yeah. And I think that this is for some small startup with a... Go ahead. No. It's going to disrupt the aeons and the axes. And yes, the yes. And, and I, I think I'm concerned about you know, building the, the, the framework. You know, what is the technology? That's, that's... No, I understand. Uh, yeah, but I, I agree. Yeah, it, it, this is, I wish I would have some, some really nice use cases. And, and, you, know. you would be leaving Ericsson this afternoon. No, I would leave, <laughs> start, make a startup, you know. Exactly. So, so where we are right now, I, I will hurry up a little bit here. But it's, it's, um, we have plenty of devices. It's fragmented, speci specialized. Things are connected, yes. To talk to each other, no. And the distinction we sometimes do between machine to machine and IoT, I don't know if that's a general notion, but it's basically that for, for uh, a machine to machine, it's basically those silos. But when it comes to um, IoT, it, it's more of a general. Things are connected to each other. So, and I, I'm just saying here, it's, it's, it's not a, it's a certain lack of standards. You know, we get more of the standards every year. But it's still, and those standards concern you know, interoperability on, on a lower level. So what, we are, what I'm looking at is on, on a higher level, you know, how can we program those guys? And I will soon get there. I will. So I think that, you know, this is who I want to be. And this guy, he's really fed up with programming towards boring REST APIs. It's uh, trying to, to uh, uh, create applications and mismatch of, of JavaScript, PHP, Go, getting things to work. I mean, writing a cloud application today is much easier than it was five years ago, and people are really happy about mic architectures and language like Go. But you know, honest, honestly, it's, it's still a really, really tricky um, um, thing to do to write cloud applications. So the thing is, we would, we would like to achieve with our work is to lower barriers to entry. You know, make it possible to, for a small company to actually write IoT and cloud applications. Facilitate code reuse and portability. So I, when I make a mining application and a surveillance application, I would like to be able to reuse code across uh, hardware platforms and across application areas. Also, think that when we talk about you know, sharing of hardware, it's you know we, in the cloud. What make make cloud so successful is that we actually share servers and hardware between app, different users and tenants. I think the same will happen in the IoT world. So if imagine that you have a, you know, surveillance just being an application for the camera. So the cameras can be used for. Um, uh, it can be used for counting cars, for counting people, tracing, uh, tracking people in the city, as well as f getting data about uh, the, the uh, pollution or humidity or something else that you can get from the camera. I mean, you just think of the camera as, as one type of sensor. And, and when I, if I want to use your sensor or your camera, then you have to allow me that, and I will be able to pay for that. So I think that sharing sensor between applications will be a very um, important use case. I know, I know in Lean Shipping, for example, where or I think it was Lean Shipping, where they had counters for cars. You know, for you know, at the, at the red lights, they were counting cars. How many? And then there was some other department at the commune that had a similar sensor, very close to that, just for maybe counting cars for the purpose of uh, tracking the CO2 in, in the city and then and emission. So you can think of think of the city as being one big computer where you can charge, you can, you can share sensors, you can charge for somebody using my sensor and so on. So I think that is an interesting, very super interesting case. And then the marketplace, there must be a way for, for selling applications. So if I'm a developer, I would like to develop my application and I would like to deploy it um, on, on an infrastructure to the operator and the, the guy who actually runs the application is not the same who developed it. So I will develop it and I will give it to Telia who will actually will do the life cycle management. So those are the things that we are, are looking into. And, and here's, here's the camera should be tested in, in uh, home care. That was from last year, last week's uh, newspaper. You know, can you imagine that also this is basically the security case that we are always joking about, you know, having a camera in your bedroom and then it's on the first page on the, on the newspaper. So I th and, and, and imagine then combining this with a world where you can actually share your, your sensors with each other and, and the, 
I will tap into your camera because I will actually allow you. Some, some applications will allow, I will allow to uh, use the camera, such as uh, um, my surveillance. I have securitas can tap into my camera and, uh, and the hem warden, but maybe not uh, Jan. Oh, no. <laughs> so I think that's security. So, so what we are, I will skip ahead here. So the idea is here, when everything is becoming, being programmable, you know, this, then the world becomes a very big distributed computer. That's how we think of it. So basically, you can program all those nodes. Um, and the task is then how, you know, the challenge is how would you do that? And, and uh, what we have, we're working on is a system called Calvin, which is led by Per Passion, who is, is here more, much more frequently than I am. Um, and he has, has made this slide, for example. And this is, this is a, and I think that we actually have some project here on, on Calvin for at, at some point. That's correct, or? Well, we have plans for it. Okay. <laughs> so basically, the idea is to have an abstract description of the application, um, of the sort of, and then you have, um, so you have, you describe certain pieces of the application, you connect the pieces together, you make a deployment, and the deployment phase is basically, and, and those interesting pieces about this is that you can move from those quadrant and being different roles. So here is the sort of the small company, here is the bigger company, here is the uh, operator, um, and so on, to, to sort of distinguish the roles between the different players. So being able to have a small company at Ideon who develops some components, connect them together in a market, you, you deploy them, and that could be Telia, and then you have some other who actually uh, does some resource management. So basically trying to find a cut between those roles to to, to create innovation. So, so what we have in our setup is basically you describe your application on a high level in an abstract way using an actor-based model, if you're familiar with that. It's a, if you know Akka, Scala have an Akka model, you have Erlang is another one. Um, we've, been, we've been working with this, this modeling for um, maybe 10 years, um, but for uh, doing cell phones and then multi-core programming for the base station. And we, we, when we moved to cloud, we just well, you, we took what we had and we continued with the, this model for, for the IoT in cloud. We're digging where we're standing. So, so basically, what we think of this is uh, you have an application here. You know, this was my pipeline. It's scrambled here on the base station where I threw it out. And then we are looking at the problems. How can you map those nodes onto this, this graph here uh, and also at the same time maintain some latency? If those cars are coming at each other, you would like to maybe have some, some guarantees, if possible, for the communication latency. If it's you know, two minutes or two seconds, it will actually make a difference. You don't, it's, not, it's not that we think that they're going to be controlling each other, but they might be exchanging information over the cellular network. Another thing is that we are you know, thinking of this as sharing resources. So you can have several applications. So we have the gray application and the brown application, and they're sharing resources. So they're basically populating this, this huge uh, computer. And then the number of those different colors of applications will sort of be um, fairly, fairly large. And, the, and the, sort of the dynamic uh, deployment here is to keep track of where they're going to be uh, right now. And if you think of this application here, that this, this bus is moving. So, and this is connected to this base station because they want to have low latency. Now, what, ha what happens is that you will have to be able to move code around very, flu very, very freely and quickly in, in the network. And for that to be possible, you cannot have virtual machines or containers or anything. You have to have a very lightweight programming model, um, which would allow you to just... Is, is there a tool there today to, to actually open up, say, the radio base station for anyone to tap into and write software? I think that's where the disclaimer comes in. Okay. But I think that... I mean, what, I knew that was something. No, but, but it, it was, what's happening is that, that this infrastructure is, is, is becoming more and more virtualized and more and more open, and that you will be able to... Uh, technically, it is possible. So then, then it, I mean, technically it's possible. Commercially, I, I guess there is a, a quite a, quite some time into the future. But it's it's technically possible, but it, it, and it, that wasn't the case two years ago. So it's it's changing. And uh, but to, to, to the range, to, to the what, how this is going to be virtualized? There are several um, um, ways to skin that cat. And and uh, right now we don't know. But it's it's. Um, 
what you can have is breakout boxes here. So basically you have to take the IP signal and you route it to a computer that is located close to the base station. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. So then it, had, it doesn't have to go back to the core network. So and that is also and that's a solution that's been available for, for a long time. Basically, having a something that filters out IP packets and routes them to a closer computer. So here, so basically, what you are looking into in this this product here is resource management and adaptivity. How can we make applications that adapt to to uh, uh, circumstances? Here we actually have a. If you think of this, this bus and those, everything, as, as, that's our hardware, that's our computer, then that computer will change all the time. So you have to adapt the changes, and then the radio links will change, and the amounts of the load will change over time. So that is what we are looking at, adaptivity. We have, um, oh, it's basically the same autonomous system. We would like this to be not done by you know, one central node, but we think that it will be done in a, in a very distributed fashion, given that we are considering right now 28 billion devices. In the future, it might be 150 billion devices and lots of applications. How will you manage keeping track of this? So it has to be sort of, um, and then we would like to close the loop on top of this, to, for example, to do mining applications and cars and so on. Security, I think that is a, a hard nut to crack because if, if you think of the scenario of information or sensor sharing, I would like to move my code around. I would like to be able to, to rent your camera Maybe because we, we are neighbors and uh, there is something f funky going on in my house, I would like to, can I just use your camera for a while? And you say, yes, you can. Um, yeah, but you have to make sure that I will only do that for a certain period of time and so on. And I, you, you might want to ch charge for it. So in here is maybe the heart of what we do. It's software architecture and languages for, for this. Yeah. As I said, I, I'm, I'm a software guy, so this is where I really am interested in. You know, how can we formulate an application. What, I mean, what is an IoT application in this, in this scenario? Um, and how can we make it? And, and, the, and, and the end game is to make the small developer, you know, uh, make it possible for the small developer to, to uh, write applications for IoT and not necessarily be a big uh, company like SAP or, and Ericsson. And then we have, you know, business models because I think that market should be tied to this. And uh, you know, how can you make money? How can I charge? Uh, and for that, we are looking into distributed ledgers like, like everybody else to see if that could help us, um, the blockchains and stuff like that. So uh, this is some equations, I just have them here in, just in case, looks, <laughs> looks good. <laughs> so yes, uh, I, I'm ready for questions. Here, uh, these slides are a presentation I made by, by a bunch of other people. And this is a book from a guy at Ericsson called Jon Hedler. He's sort of the IoT uh, head honcho and he wrote a book called From Machine to Machine to the Internet of Things. That is, a, I think, um, a good read. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, any questions? Let's start by giving you all an applause.